Well, thank you. It is great to see everybody here. Uh, thank you to Bank of America again for letting us come and be here uh, in this venue. Uh, Pi Data started about three years ago uh, in 2012, a tiny little gathering of folks, like-minded folks, trying to basically make Python better and really get to a point where we could start saying things like this, like Python as a Zen of data science. They're a little bit bold, a little bit, uh, um, and I'll talk a little bit why I think that's the case. But I really am grateful for the organizers and those who have been here. I want to reiterate Jeff's words. It's, it's a lot of behind the scenes work um, that goes on. I, I'm, I'm able to see a lot of it, not all of it, and it humbles me to see how much effort goes into the, the work here. It also humbles me to see how much effort goes into the tools and the progress they're making rapidly, and it's very exciting to see. My co-founder, Peter Wang, is, uh, he's, he's on his way. He was uh, uh, very ill, so I'm, I'm, I'm impressed he's gonna come out here. Uh, I'll likely give the talk, even though he helped me prepare it, and there's a lot of ideas. Those of you who have seen us both talk will see so definitely some of the influence of, uh, of Peter Wang in the words today. So um, it's great to be here. So I want to talk today about uh, data science uh, and how, Py how Python could be considered the zen of data science and move on to kind of some of the tools that we're working on and how they can help uh, us even farther along the zen. So data science, uh, Philip Spar Stark, uh, professor of chair of statistics, University of Berkeley. Um, looks like our slides are cut off at the bottom, unfortunately. I'm not sure what the rendering here is. Um, okay, I'll have to, I wonder if we can fix that actually. Maybe we can't. Uh, so I'll have to just make sure that some of the things we get cut off at the bottom, unfortunately. Uh, the slides will be online later, so you can take a look at them. But the point about data science is it actually connects three different things, at least three different things, and this particular framing gives us an interesting way to look at it, uh, because the insights come by the intersection of all three of these things, subject matter expertise, critical thinking, applied statistics, access to tools. If you kind of miss one, then you get things like you know, incorrect conclusions. If you just have the subject matter expertise and access to tools, but you don't have critical thinking or applied statistics, or you get, um, inability to deliver or execute if you don't have access to tools. We've all probably seen in our lives, in our work, some aspect of, of centering in some of these spaces. And insights kind of come in the beginning, in the middle of that. And so really we're talking kind of about, if we're gonna say Python is the Zen of data science, well first a little history about Zen, like what is, what is Zen? Um, Zen, it, instead of just being a, a marketing ploy to sell oriental books and uh, novels, uh, Zen actually does, is a, is a religious tradition from the, from the East. Uh, Buddhism was about a lot of sutras, a lot of doctrines. It had, there's a, here's a 80,000 texts uh, in one housed location in the Far East, kind of showing all the rules and the doctrines surrounding that one group of scholars put together for Buddhism. And uh, really influenced also by Tao. And Taoism, Zen really is about finding the core, finding the root, finding the, finding the essence of something. Uh, focusing on the thing rather than all the details, the doctrines, the, the uh, accoutrements around it. So what are the, what are the things? Um, one, one metaphor is if Zen is the moon, all the things are, are fingers pointing to the moon. So if, if the, the Zen is the thing you're actually after. So it can be categorized as the Zen approach. And this comes from Zen mind, beginner's mind. The Zen approach about the right practice, the right attitude, the right understanding. The Zen way of calligraphy, for example, is to write in the most straightforward, simple way, as if you're a beginner, not trying to make something skillful or beautiful, but simply writing with the full attention, as if you're discovering what you're writing for the first time. So those of you familiar with Python can kind of see yourselves at the, in a Jupyter, uh, notebook or at the command line, trying to explore and understand your data, make a connection with it, and discover the data around you instead of just you know, trying to build a system and then hopefully land on it sometime later. This, the right understanding, let's dig a little deeper here, um, you know, one articulation of Zen is, the, you know, is somebody who quotes, say, the purpose of studying Buddhism is not to study Buddhism, but to study ourselves. You are not your body. It's not it's, it, you are not your body. And Python, you could kind of make a similar claim, the purpose of writing Python code, not just to produce software, but to study ourselves. You are not your technology stack. Uh, so you can actually you know, think of the Pythonic approach to data science. Uh, you know, compose, here, here's just a, an attempt at describing that Pythonic approach. Uh, choose language primitives, built-ins, classes, wherever possible. Don't try to invent your own object stack if you don't need to. Choose the language primitives. Uh, uh, much more powerful and accessible than trying to memorize a huge list of proprietary functions. Uh, re reject artificial distinctions about where data should live and where it gets computed. Uh, empower every individual to use their own knowledge instead of taking the design power of their hands with preordained architectures and stacks. Really about 
and then you know, why Python? We'll get a little deeper into the kind of the, the Pythonic approach to data science and what Pythonic data analysis looks like and how that could be considered Zen. Uh, why Python? Let's start there. Python itself has grown into a powerful tool for data ana analysis, really because of its roots as a teaching language, I believe, because it's accessible to a lot of a large group of people. Many people confuse Python, actually. You see a lot of literature, a lot of, a lot of tech writers. They'll often talk about Python, and they'll focus on one of these stacks, kind of, or one of these angles only. A lot of folks will focus on Python programmers, and they'll think, oh, Python the language, and they'll look at books that people writing, that developers are using, and they'll miss a whole class of users who aren't developers, never categorize themselves as developers, but are using Python. None Nonetheless, Th those are the people that are usually here or coming to a SciPy conference or trying to understand the, the Python as a tool for data analysis. And then in the, in the middle, we have kind of the tool builders. I've always considered myself to kind of be right in the middle there. Um, I've become more of a programmer over the years, but I you know, started square in the middle as a scientist programmer. Uh, usually build simple things, uh, just patient in many cases, just had the, had the patient to pull a bunch of Netlib Fortran code and wrap them into Python and put it out to the web. That wasn't really brilliant work, it was a lot of tedious work, but it was just sort of, this needs to be there, this needs to exist, I'm gonna do it, and Python makes it easy and accessible to me. I want others to have that power as well, but with richness behind it. Analysts, even, all the way up to people who don't code hardly at all. They cut and paste, it's cut and paste programmers. They get paid for the insight. They just want to be able to call functions, stick a few things together, have a little bit of extensibility, and don't take that away and hide it behind just a simple uh, graph or a big red solve button. Have the ability to do some change. Have the ability to program a little bit a certain way. Python supports all of these use cases. And so when you go to a, a Python, when you think about Python, it's actually, an, it's not just a community, it's a society, it's an ecosystem. There isn't just one group of people in it. And that can be confusing, actually, to newcomers, because you go and you talk to somebody, you go, well, okay, which Python tribe are you, actually? Because there's different tribes. Even inside of data science and scientific computing, there's folks that, no, I'm a data scientist, no, no, I'm a comp computational scientist, no, I'm, I'm a Pandas user, no, I'm a NumPy user, even though they're all kind of mixed and, or, and organized with each other. There's a lot of folks in our Python ecosystem, which I think is important because there are a lot of people in the world. And so if you think about getting at the root of computing, you, do, or you are gonna have to get at the root of people, and you have to have something that's accessible to a large number of people that can be approached by many of them. So I think, again, more about Pythonic data analysis. One of the key things, I believe, and a mistake often made, particularly data analysis, is to, you want to connect people with the data as soon as possible. The first step in data analysis is not go buy a big system and hope somebody uses it. You know, it's not just more hardware and more data. There's been a lot of push, a lot of promotion around, just go get all the data, store it there, and then you can be like Google. Because they stored all their data, now they're doing a lot of cool things. So if you did that, maybe you'll do some cool things too. Well, there's a few steps between here and there and storing your data just somewhere you can all get at, you can just hopefully use it. In some sense, people have been doing that for a long time. They just called it Oracle or they called it SQL Server or they called it, they put their data somewhere in, in a database. The problem is always accessibility. It's about connecting the people that know what to do with the data and make it available to them. And that's really what Python excels at, actually. Python excels at the agility of connecting people to their data and their models. Uh, that's really what the PyData stack means. There's a great essay by Guido that I read when I was a younger person. Uh, I can see this beard here is to kind of indicate that I'm an older person now. <laughs> now when I was a younger person, I remember reading uh, Guido talked about Python and about connecting with your code and making mistakes quickly, staying connected. Talked to Raymond Hedinger, he's a great teacher of Python and he talks constantly about staying in connected with your data and making progress against your code by just reading your data, always being connected with what you're doing and what you're trying to do next. Rather than kind of starry-eyed dream about what you might do, then hope it works in production somehow when you apply it to a big, you know, to a big data lake. Right, there's a lot of disconnects happening today because of that, Python can help. But it's tricky, there's some real challenges too because the immediate connection usually comes with in memory, usually because it's in memory, you can do it immediately, there's an immediate response. And going to scale usually means getting more computers involved. And that has latency implications, it has uh, delay, it has latency implications, it has uh, implications on things, some things that you do easily in memory don't really parallelize very well and scale certain operations, things like sorting, things like shuffling data around. It doesn't work so well at thousands of nodes when, you, when your data exists all over the place and you have to do a cross shuffle across everything. That works just fine when you're thinking about a single memory stack. But PyData means agility. Uh, let the data drive the analysis, not the technology stack. 
that's, that's a hope, that's a dream, that's what we're working for, it's a lot of people are working for. Right now, the technology stack is still driving a lot of our analysis. Like, here's your, st here's your stack, here's your cluster, here's what you can do, okay, now here's your window that you can look at your data with. But, well, that's okay, I don't know how to look through that window, this is what I want to do, I'm a, here's, the under here's the concepts I want to understand, I don't have to, I have to mentally map that to something else. Uh, let the data drive. And that usually means the data scientists and the data analysts need to drive the, the decision, the technology stack. One great thing about Python is that it has this notion, you talk to a lot of scientists, and I've asked them over the years, why do you use Python? Why, why have you chosen Python? Uh, one interesting thing about Python in 2011, Peter and I noticed at the Strata conference with a lot of big data vendors, is there was nobody on the floor of the, boot, of the uh, event floor you know, selling anything that even talked about Python, it was all everything else. You go to the talks, at least half of the talks, people were using Python. So there's nobody promoting it, but it had been selected by the people, them, by, by people who had been using it. So that was a really important observation, and of course I felt like I was one of those people kind of in the middle in the trenches, and so that's why we started Continuum, really, was to just support that, kind of help those folks in the, uh, the wind, the, the, the wind of other technologies that are being promoted and coordinate with those technologies where possible. Um, but I've asked lots of scientists why Python, and, they've, and they said it fits my brain. It gets out of my way. There's another way to kind of a corollary of that. I don't have to think about the language, I think about what I'm doing, rather than getting stuck in you know, which concept am I using, having to learn a whole lot of um, other kinds of ideas. Uh, scale out's a later step. It's an important step, and Python can work with you there too. They're great duels no matter where your data is stored or how it's stored or, or what you, how your cluster is managed. Uh, not tied to a particular distributed story. That's a great thing about Python is it, it, it's a heterogene, it's heterogene genius. It, it's a glue for you everywhere. So of course if I'm talking about Python as the zen of data science, I have to talk about the zens inside of Python itself. So this is really tiny because uh, you're not going to read it here. <laughs> this is go, uh, import this at your prompt, and you can get the full beauty of the Xen and Python. I will just select one, um, because it was a mistake I made as a young, inexperienced, well, I should have been more experienced, but I was maybe in a hurry, <laughs> uh, developer trying to make, get, get NumPy out the door. Uh, in the face of ambiguity, refuse the temptation to guess. Right? Uh, there's a few things inside of NumPy that are actually, they're really bad, actually. There's, there's only a couple things, actually. Most of it I'm pretty proud of. Um, there's a few places where it's like, that really, really sucked. <laughs> and, and really, it can be driven down to making a mistake here of refusing, not, I didn't refuse the temptation to guess, I guessed, and guessed badly. So, because um, there's ambiguity, just don't do it. There's a lot of other nuggets of wisdom here. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I put this list together, the Zen of NumPy, I'll put in parentheses in pandas, maybe I'll work with Jeff to kind of organize an actual Zen of pandas. <laughs> but there's some ideas here that are common to both, both systems. Uh, stride is better than scattered. I'll just point array-oriented, data-oriented is often better than object-oriented. One of the challenges I see in data today is people, they want to build objects, and that's great for mental modeling about your thoughts, but when you try to put in production a bunch of objects scattered all throughout history, it really makes it difficult. You see this concept today also surfacing in the notion of column-oriented. Everyone's gonna think that's gonna be column-oriented. It's like, yes, welcome to the 40s. <laughs> no, welcome to the 60s. Like, that's yes, exactly right. That's what array computing is all about. That's why we've been focused on it, why APL existed, why NumPy existed. And people who have been using NumPy and Pandas have recognized that for a long time. And it's great to see that energy start to actually make traction in the broader world. Um, split, apply, combine, and you know, vectorize is awesome. I'll put here, you know, write more ufunks and generalize ufunks. Those of you who don't know how to do that with Numba, you're missing out on a huge opportunity. Uh, I noticed that I probably haven't promoted that enough because it is extremely powerful. And most of you, if you're using pandas or using NumPy and you're not, you don't know what a, how to let Numba build you a generalized ufunk, you have a problem because you're missing out on a lot of potential power that you're not taking advantage of. So I'll just say more uh, later about that. And then here's my attempt, it's a very, you know, 1.0, you know, maybe Python as the Zen of data science. Uh, uh, you know, this is a big disclaimer, it'll probably revamp. This is, what do they call the, uh, the Crapple license? Well, this is released under the Crapple, C-R-A-P-L license, which means basically it's, it's, it's just barely started, and you can, get, you can use it if you want, you can get rid of it if you don't want. Um, get more and better data, be the first start. Data, data needs to drive the conversation, and 
just after that is better data. How do you know how you've got better data? Well, it's better models. You don't know if you have better data unless you have a model about the data, so get better models too. Get better, more and better data, more and better models. How you compute matters, especially today where you have a, a, an increasing divergence between the ideal compute and the actual compute. You see a lot of energy going into a, a multi-core and GPU. Array computing is a lot easier today than to take a bunch of little individual processors and try to do things distributed with a bunch of little things. Uh, orders of magnitude, three, four, five, three, four, at least, and sometimes even five orders of magnitude speed differences. That can make a huge difference when you're trying to get something done. Uh, can, I've, I've seen it in production at places make a difference between people tearing their hair out, not going to home on weekends, and be able to actually go home because it takes 24 hours to do something to it takes 20 minutes to do something so they can actually iterate more quickly. Uh, that's where computation time matters tremendously is if it interferes with your ability to be agile. If you, can, if you can't fail quickly, fail quickly and often, but not in the same way. <laughs> right, you don't want to keep doing the same thing over and over again. But you do need to, iter to iterate and be agile means you've, you're failing, essentially. So failing is not a dirty word, it's a good thing if you're learning from it and able to do it quickly. Put the data in the hands and minds of people with knowledge. Where and how the data is stored is secondary to analysis and understanding. Uh, that's not typically what a lot of uh, money is being spent to try to convince you otherwise, basically. Uh, but it's catching up. People are recognizing that the only way f to use the data that you're storing so greatly is to actually put analysis, understanding, and tools for those folks in, the hand, in their hands. Um, this is a little bit controversial, perhaps, but uh, you know, premature horizontal scaling with apologies to, to Nuth. <laughs> premature horizontal scaling is the root of all evil. But if you look at that broader text, I'm referencing the premature optimization is the root of all evil. If you look at his broader statement, he says actually optimization is necessary at times. So that's why I'm partly using that is because horizontal scaling is necessary at times, but let's not, it's not necessary a lot of times. <laughs> There's a lot of times just solve the problem first, understand what you're doing first, then talk about how to scale it. Because when you must scale, data locality, parallel algorithms are the key, and you have to learn to think in the building blocks that can be parallelized. And that takes some time. That's, that's the key that'll take some time. So I want to spend the last few, the last time part of my talk talking about how the, the PyData stack that exists and some of the tools we're using at Continuum to kind of help Python continue to be a better zen of data science. There's about three million users in the PyData stack. Don't, I mean, you can quote me on that, I guess, but I don't, I mean, it's, it's, it's intentionally like only one significant figure. <laughs> I, I don't really know how many there are, but I, it's roughly, it's at least in that, in that category. Um, and on top of NumPy is, of course, a rich set of tools. SciPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, uh, Scikit-Image, DAS models, and Scikit-Learn, and the Jupyter stack, and lots of AstroPy, OpenCV. There's a tremendous number of other tools, and that's the power of the Python system, actually. Um, it's great to be a Python user, right? I mean, it's, it's sort of, if you're a Python user, you think, hey, I have this interesting problem to solve, and it's not just necessarily a data science problem, but maybe it's a data gluing or a data engineering problem, and you look around and you say, oh, there's somebody who already thought about this and did something in that direction. So it's gonna be very, very powerful. One of the challenges, though, in that space when we start a continuum is, okay, awesome, I just have now a 1,000 packages that I wanna use, how do I actually deliver that reliably in a way that isn't just, okay, I've got, I've got that delivered, but 5,000 people in my organization each have delivered it differently. <laughs> Slightly different changes, and they're all using kind of their own uh, integration systems. We started with continuing with three goals. Scale the NumPy PyData stack horizontally. You know, take the, num the PyData, uh, NumPy Pandas, and make it scale horizontally, give the ability to do that. Make it easy for Python users to produce data science applications in their browser, include with, visu with heavy visualization, and then get more adoption of the PyData stack. Those are really our goals. So we didn't think about putting out a distribution of Python when we first started, but very quickly it was realized, okay, we have a lot of things we're trying to ship. We gotta figure out a way to ship that really easily. So we wrote a package manager, Conda, and then a distribution of Python and R, turns out. We can ship R the same way we're shipping Python. And we call that Anaconda. Anaconda is, in my mind, it really is a game-changing, enterprise-ready Python distribution. It's BSD licensed uh, with our new Anaconda subscriptions. We've recently made Py Anaconda itself, the core uh, BSD license, so you can use it, distribute it, put it wherever you like. Um, you know, tell us about it if you like, but don't if you don't want to. Uh, just use it, and particularly use the ability that the Conda has to quickly make easy micro-containers. There's a lot of users of, of, you're not alone if you're using Anaconda, there's at least, you know, we don't know how many users of Anaconda exactly, but there have been two million downloads in the last two years. 
200K a month and growing. Uh, five million packages per month are served via the Conda Package Monitor from just our repositories. Of course, anybody can make a repository and serve packages from them, so uh, it's certainly not a, a tracking all of the potential users. There are a lot of users, and some of you, uh, this is users of the Anaconda stack. Um, certainly not all of them, but there's certainly a lot of them. Uh, a lot of people are able to use these tools. So what does Anaconda provide you? If you haven't heard of it, you're not using it, uh, try it out. It really provides, one way to describe it is portable user level environments. Easy to install, quick and agile data exploration. It really adds the agility to not just the coding that I'm doing, but the deployment that I'm doing. So I can try some stuff out. I can be in my stack and I can go, there's a common story, people were scared. I literally talked to people, one of the folks who just started with us, he was scared to use Anaconda because he was scared to touch his Python distribution. And I had to just smile at him because I understood how he felt. I did. He's like, oh, I spent two weeks getting this Python installation working for me. I can't change it. I went, I know. That's how it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I feel your pain. But I, you know, it was awesome when I could just delete my Python installation. I didn't care because I can get it back in like two seconds. And I can do that over and over and over again. I can have 100 different Python distribution or installations on one machine or on a box of machines. Easy, easy to use. And that's what Conda has brought to the community. It's simple to collaborate. You can specify your environment. You can specify your requirements, ship them, and reproduce something exactly as you want it. And it's accessible to all. I'll say about how Anaconda solves kind of a big picture problem with traditional analytics that may not be obvious at first glance, but it's related to how come Python is the data, is the zen of data science. Traditional analytics, you have your data here, you have an ETL process where you extract, transform, load the data, pull from the data to something, and from there you can do data mining or modeling. And usually these are separated by wide chasms and large systems and a lot of expense. And then on top of the data mining or modeling, you'll have some usage or some BI reports and maybe a production application, a deployed application in production. And it kind of really can sit on top of all of that and make those chasms like a bridge over all those chasms. All the, and of course, when I say Anaconda, those in the know here understand that it's really the tools of the PyData stack and allowing you just to connect all the different things that are available and make them accessible to the data, to the user, so that you can be driven completely by your data. You, by, you basically put in the hands of your data scientists and your experts driving the reports. All that middle, middle ground that's traditionally been dominated by fiefdoms and people who own different things, you can actually just bypass a lot of it and help uh, connect the people together. I'm gonna skip over the features of Conda. If you don't know about Conda, some of you are Anaconda users, don't know about Conda, you're missing out. You're missing a really capable feature set that could be helping you. Helping you try new things out, helping you uh, in development, helping you in production, helping you deploy things. Uh, it's got excellent support for system level environments. It's like having mini VMs, but it's much lighter weight. We sometimes call them micro containers or the undocker. Uh, you can sit on top of Docker, but you really want to be able to have a simple um, application with a lot of dependencies. Conda can manage all of those very easily and reproduce you very quickly. It's a very simple format, so anybody can produce a Conda package. But there are tools, standard tools to build them, but you can make one pretty easily. It's just a tarball with some metadata. It's easy to create multiple channels. You can make your own repository with a Conda index command on an HTML served set of files. And it integrates very well with PIP and other language platform uh, package managers like NPM and R, and RC ran uh, install commands. So there's the basic commands. These will be available on the slides later. There's even advanced Conda usage and the documentation. There's actually some cheat sheets out on our desk table if you want. So probably one of the better things to grab if you, if you leave here. And you know, environments are a big deal. Environments are implemented efficiently on Windows, Mac, and Linux with hard links and soft links or copies if necessary, but only if necessary. So you can have gigabytes of packages and only only copy them if you need to. If it's the same environment, you just have a link. And so you're sharing lots of the same set of cache data across many, many environments. And some of you may know about Anaconda Cloud. We're really encouraging folks to sign up for Anaconda Cloud. It's free, but it's a place you can store. If you, if, you, know, you can just build a kind of index on top of any repository you like, but if you don't want to do that effort and you just want to have a package you want to ship to the world and have everybody see, you can upload it to Anaconda Cloud and we'll host it for you, as long as it's publicly available, it's free, but if you want to kind of only limit it to a few, certain few people, then you do have to sign up for a subscription. But publicly available is free. That same system and technology is actually available to put behind your repository. If you're a commercial uh, location where you want to have private on-premises uh, features, it's all available. You can install the things you see in Anaconda Cloud behind your firewall. 
want to talk a little bit about Anaconda Cluster because I think it's an underappreciated thing. Um, not many people know about it. It's basically one key uh, uh, tool. Uh, it is only available for subscribers. You can use it for free on four nodes anywhere and on 16 nodes on cloud systems, you know, Azure and uh, AWS. Uh, or you can get a license and use it behind your firewall for as many as you like. But it helps you basically robustly manage the runtime state on all your nodes in a cluster. So you can now bring the power of Anaconda easily to everything and interact with Hadoop, uh, the Hadoop system, uh, like Spark. Here's a quick way to build a Spark cluster with a simple profile and create it, submit a job to it, destroy it very, very easily. Many people who we've had use this system, it's like it's the fastest way to set up Spark they've, they've seen. So it's very, very simple to get started with the cluster, uh, the cluster tools you're used to. Uh, you can manage on your cluster, manage the environments that are available on each cluster, and you can easily remote send arbitrary commands to every node in the cluster. And here's an example with a Spark command. Um, a lot of people are using PySpark, that's great, it's a good start. Uh, we do have some higher level approaches that we're encouraging to integrate Python, to what I consider to be more Pythonic approaches. Uh, PySpark is, is useful, but you want to be able to have an approach that will scale out not just to Spark, but to any other system in Paula that comes down the, down the pipe. Uh, here's a quick way, though, to basically do a simple um, job that uses a Spark context. All right, I want to spend a little bit of time talking kind of about uh, Continuum's approach to some of these problems. Uh, basically thinking about making Python the zen of data science and continuing that effort. Uh, Blaze has been our, our, our project. It's a big project and it's turned into an ecosystem. It started as kind of a next generation NumPy pandas, which is really set as a as a, a, a rallying cry to get people who were interested in the same concept to join us in that effort. Uh, there was some funding uh, that we uh, used from uh, some sources to help promote it. But it really is an infrastructure for metadata, meta compute, and expression graphs and workflows. It's, a, it's, it's still emerging, and it's actually made a lot of progress, and it's, it's even usable. There are, there's multiple projects inside the, eco, the ecosystem that are extremely usable, and then Blaze library is also uh, usable today, although it's, it's uh, refocusing and is still, I would consider to be, the Blaze library is still, I would consider to be betaware. Uh, so if you're using it, work with us, coordinate with us, because we're working, we're still making it what we need it to be. But Blaze really, the whole concept of Blaze is really Glue 2.0. It's to, you know, Python's legacy is a powerful Glue language to manipulate files, call fast libraries, integrate things, disparate things. The next generation Glue needs to integrate disparate compute silos, data silos, disjoint memory and compute runtimes, transcend legacy models on computers, make it so that you can write an expression. One of the thing, one of its goals is to eliminate the problem today of when you have a data query and a data science problem, your first question is where is the data stored? How is it stored? You have to answer that question because that, the answer to that question drives how you write your analysis. It's very similar to the days of our, our legacy days in the 60s where we had different kinds of machines. You had a compute problem, you said, well, which machine are you on? Because I have to write my assembly differently. Right? And we didn't have C, we didn't have Fortran. In fact, Fortran was written to solve that problem and give people a common way to write expressions that were not run on multiple machines. We kind of back to the same problem a little bit because we have different machines, different systems. SQL also was written for that purpose as well, to write different databases, same, same language. Blaze is in, is in some sense the SQL of Python for data science, for big data. It lets you write, data, write, write expressions in one language and have multiple backends that actually support it. and give you an opportunity to do some optimizations. Here's a little slide deck that kind of explains Blaze. Peter Wang put these together. I'll hopefully do them justice. If he Actually, he's joined us in the back, so maybe you can come up and uh, if you have real questions, you can ask him. <laughs> but he can't talk. Oh, he's sick. That's right. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Peter. I won't put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, in the beginning, we have data. And we have, we have, we have brains, actually. Well, in the far beginning, brains emerged. Then we have brains trying to understand data. So pencil and paper, math, you know, did some cool stuff. Uh, Gal, you know, Galileo Gauss, these guys are pretty smart. They're doing some math. The math gets, the data gets bigger. The math gets harder. Uh, we scratch our head, try to figure out what to do. So we uh, build computers, and we have computers doing the math for us. Okay, that's great, but we still don't know what the computer should do. Now there's a, what does the brain do? Now there's a brain that has to talk to the computer and make programs. Now, you know, so we, 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 it's like regex, right? We have, we have one problem to solve another problem. Now we have three problems. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now what do I do? So talk, how do brains talk to computers? How do I do that? Well, 
basically it emerged different systems to do different things. So you'd have an HTML system to maybe run a web, build a web page. What you do to build a web page versus what you do to build a SQL engine versus what you do to build a general program or, or a game like Minecraft uh, is quite different. And we call that you know, general purpose programming. So the computer does all these different things. Uh, general purpose programming turns out to be kind of hard, actually. Um, that's why we have computer science as a degree field. And people kind of learn how to do general purpose programming. And the data scientists, the people that actually want to do analysis, kind of go, OK, yeah, that's great. I don't want to become a, uh, a Java expert or a C++ expert. I want to go to my data science. So we build analytic systems. People have built domain specific languages, domain specific query languages, SQL, MATLAB, R. Um, SPSS, SAS. These are domain-specific query languages and an analytic systems. And you basically have parallel kinds of systems for building web pages, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, general Java, CPP, uh, C++, Hall of Computer Science to build games. So Blaze is really about, OK, can we do something about this a little bit? How do we, how do we take the brain, the compute, the data, join them together a little bit more robustly, a little more easily so we can mix and match. So if you think of the, the brain is really about expressions. It's what the person wants to do, kind of a high level expression approach. Uh, SQL is an example of expressions. And then the runtime, so those, you know, the runtime could be NumPy, Pandas, R, could be Julia, SQL, Spark, Mongo, Cassandra, a run to HTML system. It's basically the, the runtime compute. Then we have the data which is, you know, what kind of data is it? What metadata surrounds that? What, is it, what schema does it have? Is it distributed? What kind of data type is it? What's the data, sh um, is it HDF5? What format's it in? The expressions are operations, group buys, filters. So these sort of, are, this is what the Blaze ecosystem is designed to really help us get a handle on. Allow us to separate talking about these concepts so that we can talk about them separately and bring them together uh, in a runtime at, at the last, kind of at the final moment, as late as possible. Rather than joining them together at the hip, starting out the gate, when you can't, then you can't change anything. Once you've joined things together, you're sort of stuck. You can't refactor. So that's the whole purpose, is to make code reusable, make people able to connect to lots of runtime, lots of data. So that's really the idea of Blaze. And Blaze, the library itself, sits at the expression level. Then we have a lot of runtime. Dask, which we'll talk about later, is actually a new runtime concept, paralyzing runtime for Python. Uh, and that's all about the computes, where NumPy, where Pandas, where those runtime systems live. Then DataShape is really a metadata description to talk about data, all kinds of data that you might want to do something with. Then Odo is a tool to basically go back and forth between lots of little data shapes, lots of different kind of data containers. That's really the idea of Blaze. So if we talk about the expression level, what does Blaze do? It's an interface to query on different storage systems when we describe it. So you can have a Blaze expression and can back into Spark, or it can back into Impala, or it can back into NumPy, or, a, or Dask. It can back in, th that question of what it back ends to can be answered later. You don't have to, um, it, it, it helps you avoid the technology stack debt. Uh, oh, I made that choice to use this particular technology stack, so now I can't shift from it because it's, I've got all my code written in it. Uh, so write your code at a higher level. It, it's the same, the same really problem that SQL helps solve with the same caveats in terms of, uh, you know, we want to have performance. We want to make sure we get the best optimizations possible. Here's an example of the kinds of systems that are supported, S3, MongoDB, JSON, SQL, CSV. Obviously, the kinds of computations you can do on each of those data systems will vary. Our focus at Continuum, well, first of all, it's whatever our customers want. So if you get a client that will pay us, we will actually happily focus on whatever you'd like. <laughs> So there is a way to nerd swipe our, our brilliant nerds. However, if, if we're doing things on our roadmap, uh, we, uh, we focus on the idea of dark data and the PyData stack. We want to take the PyData stack and enable it to handle all, just all kinds of distributed data. So you look at our Dask project. We have a distributed thing. So, uh, and then having Blaze itself work really, really well on that back end. Uh, really taking, you can imagine taking Anaconda and making Anaconda into a basically a distributed database runtime on top of any data. So kind of taking all of your data out there. Dark data really is what describes your files that nobody puts in databases that you're using all the time. So Excel files, CSV files, HDF5 files, just stuff that's showing up everywhere, but you've got to get a handle on it. And then be able to do analytics on it. And Anaconda can basically be that database runtime engine you can stick near all of those data points and give yourself essentially a ad hoc database on top of everything. Uh, Blaze uh, already has features for selecting columns, filtering, operating, reducing, split, apply, combine. And what Blaze does is translate those expressions to basically different backends, including SQL backends, including Dask backends. 
at the heart of Blaze is a data shape concept. It extends the dtype concept in NumPy. Uh, if I had more time, I'd go into more detail about dtype and how I think dtype is one of the core things out of NumPy that should be factored into the Python ecosystem generally. Um, and talk more about that if somebody's interested. Uh, data shape is a very straightforward extension of the dtype, but it basically combines dimension and dtype. That gives rise to the ability to handle variable length arrays as well as ragged arrays. You can connect the two together, so you can have a, a var of int32, that's a variable length array of int32s. You can have a string, you can have uh, float64s, you can have missing data types. Here's a series of examples, arrays of structures, structured arrays are all, all supported by the data shape concept. Uh, just regular arrays, um, and then structures and all kinds of detailed, uh, uh, the, the question mark means missing data, means optional data. And uh, Dyn, which is a library we haven't talked about, Dyn is a C++ library, also in beta, still a beta product, still a beta library, uh, alpha library. Uh, it supports the data shape protocol, so you basically can do NumPy-like activities on optional data with Dyn. Blaze Server is one of the things I'm exci really excited about because it presents you can stick a Blaze server next to your data and it presents that data in a, uh, in a way that you can compute on, that other systems can understand it, use it, uh, deal with it. Uh, and you can, those become basically um, abstract tables available in a system for another, another computer in the system. So, um, and there's, there's more work coming down the pipe over the next six months on that. Here's an example of the Blaze server from Blaze import data. You stick data allowing, now there's a Blaze URI. So of course the Blaze server, what it does, it maps all the other kinds of URIs you might have, S3, SQLite, kind of abstracts those into a single name. So that anything else you have, whether it's a, a HDFS file or a series of data in any data system is now accessible as a Blaze URI, URL. And you can then look at it, see it. You're not ga you grab a piece of the data, then you write compute on it, and that compute can get sent to where the data needs to get sent in order to run the system. So compute recipes work with existing libraries on multiple backends. So with, a, with basically NumPy and pandas-like syntax, you can run on top of Spark or Impala or Mongo or, and Dask as we're seeing. So ideally layer the expressions over any data. But I want to talk, so Blaze is the high level and we're still working pretty hard on making that high level, make the, the current roadmap for Blaze is making consistency between Blaze arrays and between Dask, uh, between Dask as we'll talk about, and Pandas and NumPy, making sure that you can go seamlessly from, I'm writing some NumPy Pandas expressions. Now I want to make, see if that scales. Blaze, the whole point is to make sure only things that scale are included in it. So it's, when you translate your NumPy code to your Blaze code, you know that it scales, basically. Your Pandas code to your Blaze code, all the stuff that doesn't scale is not available. <laughs> and you kind of recognize, oh, that must not scale because it's not available. Right? That's the idea. So you can understand better how to move from interactive agile on a single machine to scale out on multiple machines. So start, Dask is actually, a, a, it's, it's lower down the stack. Blaze is a very high level, and the, the intent is for very, um, occasional developers only, so to speak. Dask is a library that is really parallel NumPy, parallel data frames, parallel pandas. It's a little more for the, the, the developer wants to get a little, their hands a little bit dirtier. You have to understand things a little bit more. It's general, fine-grained, ad hoc parallelism. Uh, it's a parallel computing framework. It leverages the excellent Python ecosystem. It's a fairly straightforward adoption. It uses blocked algorithms and task scheduling. Uh, written in pure Python, so it's easy to install, easy to put anywhere you want it. Um, the core ideas behind Dask are the dynamic task scheduling yields same parallelism. Essentially what you're doing with making parallelism is task scheduling and understanding the different things you want to do and breaking those apart. Uh, it's a sim this is a very simple library to enable parallelism. That's been proven out as a lot of people have been able to adapt Dask to their use cases. So the X-Ray project is able to use Dask at out of core uh, ND arrays, labeled arrays. Uh, I think Pandas has a, not, has a a, uh, is it really in the release yet, or is it actually just in master? It's kind of experimenting with a two parallel command. <laughs> He's, I, I've seen some code, so <laughs> but I don't know where it is. It might still be in Jeff's, Jeff's uh, single box. <laughs> but experimenting with the idea of can you take, you know, how, how, how easy is it to help somebody go from their domain to a parallel? Uh, it's not a big, bulky thing to adapt. Scikit-learn so folks have been able to use uh, DAS to enable certain kinds of grid searching, certain kinds of embarrassingly parallel searches. Uh, parameter sweeps for the partial fit capability in scikit-learn uh, has been able to adopt Dask. So Dask got a lot of input from a lot of folks very quickly because it's very simple. It's a very straightforward idea. 
Um, then you have Dask arrays and Dask data frames, which just encapsulate the, function, the functionality. And then one of the keys of Dask has always been, though we started with a multi, with an out-of-core system, is a distributed scheduler to make the work go, go easily. So classic example, an ocean temperature data, um, this is fine. You know, if you have, just have a, a 720 by 440 array each day, every fourth degree, we're used to dealing with that. It's fine, we can do average global ocean temperature data in 2015 with this simple mean calculation. Okay, that's awesome. Now if we have 36 years of that, and you don't have that much RAM, you're not at a place, I have been places people have three terabytes of RAM, so they would look at this and say, yeah, I have that RAM, no problem. I'll just still type mean. <laughs> but even if you do have that much RAM, you may not be using your cores reliably or very well, and you want to actually take advantage of multiple cores, so Dask is still useful, because it makes it easy for you to block up the different computations and run them on different cores. So a block mean calculation is what you want to do, so you got to better start chunking. So what Dask Array does is it really just does that chunking. It does an automatic chunking of your array, and so that any time you do an operation, then it maps calculations like mean, calculations like sums, onto graph calculations. Oh, I have to do this on these different things, and then I, sum, I add the results back together. That's basically what Dask Array is, is building these graphs. So the whole concept of Dask can be summarized in this slide where you have at the center of these graphs, these distributed, these directed graphs, acyclic graphs of calculations that need to be computed. You have schedulers on the right. There's a synchronous schedule, which is basically just test this, make sure it works, <laughs> make sure I get the same result as NumPy. Maybe I'm, I don't have some problem in my threading. Then there are, then there are threaded and multiprocessing. Those are single machine out of core solutions. So you can have multiple threads, which works actually, even if you're using Python code, because those of you who are familiar with the PyData stack know that a lot of the PyData stack releases the gill. I think Pandas just joined that in many, <laughs> that, that fold, but NumPy has for a long time, lots of SciPy does, Pandas does. So they release the gill when they're executing the low level C code. So you can, multi-threading does work on the PyData stack pretty well and it, you get multiple core behavior. So you have to always tongue in cheek a little bit when people talk about, oh, Python can't be scaled, it's not parallelizable, the gill's never released. And the answer is yes, if you're always just writing Python interpreter code, but the PyData stack actually does a lot of Python interpreter steering a lot of native code. And the native code can run multi-core multi just fine. Um, a Numba, which I won't get time to talk about, e makes it easy to release the gill on your compiled Python code. And then the collections are things like arrays and data frames. They're high-level things that let you just use your simple expressions you're used to, and it builds these graphs for you. And then you have a lot of schedulers beneath. The distributed schedule is something I'm excited about that is, that's just starting to come into play and over the next several months we'll make, we'll make rapid progress. So there's the, it's a simple architecture for scaling. Here's examples of using Dask Array. It's, it, the interface is just like NumPy arrays except you have a chunk parameter if you, really, if you wanna, it, there's a default chunking that'll do. If you wanna specify it, you can. And then you can basically do uh, calculations just like you do on a NumPy array, except instead of giving you an actual result, it gives back a, uh, a, a thing <laughs> that needs to be computed. Basically gives you back an a, a unevaluated result. And if the result doesn't fit into memory, you can then put it to HGF5 and compute the result that way. So Dask Array and Dask Data Frame are two interfaces to the system that both of these build directed graphs of calculations that have to be computed. And then the problem of uh, computing those can be separated out into, oh, I'm going to do a multi-core, I'm going to do multiple machines, how am I going to manage this distributed computation? So it's a really nice, simple system that can be applied to, and it, it's, what I, it's a Pythonic approach, I would say, to the problem of parallelization. And uh, you know, it learns from a lot of the tools that are out there already. Um, well, you know, here's more complex graphs. You can actually you know, uh, be very, uh, you can actually build the graphs you're, you want uh, as you want them, but you can end up, a lot of people like Dask because um, Matt Rockland was very good at creating little videos of the task actually executing. So you can look at this directed graph and you can see the task executing as it goes. Kind of builds understanding a little bit about what parallelism might mean. Uh, so you can, there's been a lot of people using it. X-Ray is one of the first projects to adopt Dask. Scikit Image has adopted Dask. Uh, and you can basically use that to build parallel runtimes. Uh, here's a great uh, blog post by Jake Vanderplas who talked about experimenting with uh, out-of-core data frames in Python to do OpenStreetMap, uh, interacting with the OpenStreetMap data set. So with very few lines of code, you can basically build very quick solutions. I've been excited about the distributed schedule for a while, and we've actually got, uh, Matt Rockland just released, it's still beta, uh, this distributed library. It's very simple. I like it because it's simple, so there's not a huge, Thank you, not a huge interface. Um, 
this is probably a good place to end because I'd love everybody to go look at Distributed. <laughs> Distributed, if you're interested in multi-core, if you're interested in Spark, if you like what Spark does for you, take a look and see. Distributed is very early, it's still new. You'll probably run into problems. Uh, so you know, talk to us if you, if you use it and want to use it to see how, how it works. However, it's very simple, so it's making progress and solidifying rapidly. Uh, what it does, it lets you define a simple cluster so the same kind of model of a center driver and it, a bunch of workers, and you can set them all up with either decluster or individually decenter and worker if you have to interface with another scheduler. And then what it does is it creates executor objects. It's ad hoc uh, Pythonic parallelism that understands DAS graphs. So you can basically, if you just use DAS, you can kind of import the distributed scheduler and just use it that way. Or if you want to get into more of the details, you can look, you can roll distributed as a separate library and start building executors and it follows the concurrent futures API in Python 3, or equivalently the futures library backported to Python 2.7, with the exception that it adds data locality. So instead of always returning results, it will return futures from, from remote systems so that they can continue in the graph. You can continue to build up future computations. So what it allows, there's a great blog post here, Python and Hadoop without the JVM. Uh, which is an awesome thing if your data stored in HDFS and you love Python and you're forced currently to narrow through the Py streaming interface. You can basically, with distributed and pandas, read and distribute and process CSV files or other files in HDFS very, very easily. And it'll be even easier coming soon. So here's just some slides showing some things you can do. Okay, so um, that's pretty much all the time I have. I have more slides here on Bokeh and Numba that I'll make available, but I wanted to basically uh, end uh, by you know, summarizing that Python is going to continue to be a very easy way to connect experts with data and produce, produce solutions rather than futzing with details. And uh, uh, that are the, at the heart of it, that's the zen of data science, is getting the attention, getting the core ideas in the hands of the people that know what they're doing and iterating quickly. So thank you for your time, and uh, maybe there's time or two for one or two questions. No questions. Okay, they're just getting there. They're just getting brave. In the back there. Yeah, Virtual Lamb does not support general C++ libraries very easily. So Conda is a general system environment capability. It uses the idea of Virtual Lamb, but it allows your Python to be more than just Python files. To be HDFS and HDF5 and anything that C++ required, anything Fortran required. All that works, all those environment, that great environment capability now works easily, just as easily. Yeah. Yeah, we work inside Docker. Docker is sort of a separate concept of, concept of virtual machines, or it's lighter weight than virtual machines. Con is even lighter weight than that. It's a, it's a file system based approach. And shared linking, the way shared linking works approach. Um, so it works inside. But what, I would, what I've found is a lot of people use Docker when they could just use Conda and, get, and, and be a lot simpler. A lot simpler, a lot less file, a lot less, me, a lot less mess. So we don't quite have the budget of the Docker folks who advertise, so. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and also, it's more than that, too. It's the, like, a lot of our systems are ruled by the IT world, by system administrators who don't understand data science, necessarily. And so they're persuaded by a different batch of things. And data you know, we wrote Conda really to help data scientists, scientists, experts. So kind of make it easier for them and try to really veer it and use the language of IT administrators to help them understand how it helps them is part of the, is part of the challenge, kind of a messaging challenge. Great question, anybody else, or do we have time? Right there. Oh, awesome, we've got a Numba fan in the audience. I love Numba too, so it's one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, yeah, she said he really enjoys working with Numba, can you tell us a little bit? I'll just show you one slide. I love the new release of Numba, by the way, I'm so excited, it's getting, we're getting close to being able to get towards 1.0. We need JIT classes, basically. And uh, you know, so Numba is basically the ability to compile Python code. So you can write image processing code in Python. You, know, you wouldn't do this before with Numba, why not? Hey, it's, it's easy, you can do it. There's also a vectorized function. Um, I would say, you know, here's the, the um, I want to make two things aware. CUDA Python is now open source. 
So you can use CUDA Py. You have to know a little CUDA. It's not necessarily, and CUDA is not easy necessarily, but it's a lot easier from Python than it is to experiment with, with, with C, C, I would say. Um, but there's some interesting things in Numba that have come out. The recent release, uh, new GPU target, had the HSA architecture supported, uh, limited support for named tuples, uh, simulator for debugging GPU functions available. You can choose to release the GIL and no Python functions, very easy to do that. Ahead of time compilation. So you can actually use Numba the same way people use Cython to produce extension modules. But you can write, it's Python code you've written, and then just produces a shared module you can ship to somebody who doesn't have Numba. So that's, that's recent and improving. It's still, it's still you know, it may, may not work in every case. You may want it to, but it's, the improvement are happening. And vectorized, geo-vectorized GPU and parallel targets now open source. So it's and an on-disk caching of your code. So you don't have to compile every time. If you warm it up, your disk may warm up with the compiled code, and then it's faster loading next time. So, all right, that's it. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.